I worked for like two weeks. I got like $500 or something. And I was like, I'm done with this. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. This week, I'm sitting down with Nadia Moonla. She's a health and sensuality coach based in Brooklyn that's helping women to understand their bodies by eliminating the noise and distraction that often surrounds them. Did you always see yourself where you are now? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> in our conversation, we talk about lady stuff, her previous career as a filmmaker, building an online business, and how to deal with criticism. It's really the person who's in the boxing ring getting beat up but trying um, that is the hero. This is The Ground Up Show. Can you hear yourself? Can I hear? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your current work and, and what it is that you do. I know that you touch on a lot of cultural taboos. Huh. Yeah, I guess. That's a really interesting uh, reflection, actually. So, well, the work that I do is that I'm, I'm a health and sensuality coach, and um, I guide women back to their bodies. And the idea behind that is that a lot of women right now in the world are just very disconnected from their bodies for many different reasons, because of the messaging that we get growing up, because of, you know, the diet industry, the... Uh, media out there that's constantly, you know, pushing Photoshop still. I mean, now we're getting a little bit better slowly, but it took mm -hmm. a while. And so as a result, women have a really bad relationship with their bodies, most of them. Mm -hmm. And also there is, we're living in a world, a system that very much, you know, values certain, um, I would say more masculine uh, traits than feminine traits. Mm -hmm. So being, or what I guess in more like neuroscience or, you know, psychiatry world would be, you know, left brain versus right brain. So l for those who don't know, left brain is primarily, um, you know, sort of uh, task oriented, uh, what we consider more masculine. And uh, of course, we both have, we, we all have both. It's just a matter of how much. Mm -hmm. And uh, right brain is a little bit more, you know, the emotional and the creative. And so a lot of women nowadays have disconnected from, um, they're so in their masculine, they've disconnected from more of their feminine energy and their feminine genius. So part of the work as well is getting them reconnected to this piece of them that they have you know, gotten messaging around is pretty dangerous. So you do a couple of different things. You do some dance classes, like specifically, what are some, some of the things that you do? You do some coaching. So walk mm -hmm. me through that. Yeah, sure. So um, as a coach and um, I guess an embodiment advocate, I have a few different modalities that I work through, but ultimately the goal is the same, which is to get women more connected to their feminine bodies and their sensuality, um, which are of course interconnected. And one way in which I do that is I have one-on-one um, -on -one coaching. So I have programs where I just work with women. They can be anywhere in the world. And we work through Skype or, I mean, we've got a million platforms nowadays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we find a way to connect and um, we do all our work online. And then I also have group programs. So I bring together circles of women uh, also from across the globe. Like right now I'm running a group program. I've got a woman in China. I've got a woman in Hawaii and everywhere in between. So, and we get together and we also explore a lot of these topics and we go through what I call like the four phases of embodiment, which we, you feel free to ask about that down the line if yeah. that feels important. And, um, and then I have these dance classes, which I teach in New York and sometimes I travel with, and they are essentially, um, classes where we, you know, again, it's a woman only space because the idea behind that being, and it's for anyone who identifies as woman. So the, the idea being that it's a space that doesn't have the male gaze. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because a lot of women, um, don't feel, they feel a little bit, you know, scared and unsafe when they're, you know, around the male gaze. And so they're able to explore parts of themselves when there isn't men there. And mm -hmm. so these classes are essentially depending on whether I'm doing the one hour format or, you know, a half day format. They're also, um, you know, we work through, you know, we do some breath work and some dancing. Oh, you do breath work. My sister's a, a breath A little work bit. Teacher. Yeah, yeah. So mine isn't like, you know, the, the fancy breath work. <laughs> <laughs> She's like the high end <laughs> breath work sessions. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's, it's, 
all of us know how to breathe, right? Which mm-hmm. this is part of what's, I mean, this is what we've forgotten. We've forgotten just the basic inhale, exhale. Mm-hmm. And so we work a lot with, um, you know, them getting present and mindful in their bodies and reconnecting to their curves and what it feels like to actually explore your body the same way you would a lover's because we get so excited about touching other people, Mm -hmm. but mostly women are not in their experience in their bodies when they're actually, you know, being sensual or even just in their day to day could be going down, you know, walking down the street. Uh, and there's one way that a woman can walk on a mission and there's another way where she's like, you know, like mm-hmm. really in touch with all her senses. And so we, I work through the five senses to get them connected to their sensuality. And then, um, through that they can access their sensual body and their femininity more. So, uh, I, I want to get into down in a little bit, how you built this business like that. I find to be very interesting and fascinating, especially as I've always done client based work. So to be able to do something in the coaching realm, to create programs mm. and classes, this kind of stuff is totally new to me. So I really want to learn about it. Um, but you have an interesting path to uh, into filmmaking and, and, all, and all this, making a, a feature length film. But I want to talk about how you got started out. Like, did you always see yourself where you are now? Hmm. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess when I, when I started out... Uh, Ever since I can remember, I mean, since my teen years and, you know, when you start to think about like, oh, what do I want to be when I grow up? Um, I always had a fascination with women. Like, I feel like women and women's issues have always been um, sort of the the through line in all my work. So when I went to university, I was, you know, I was first... um, really excited about development work and that's what I uh, majored in. And so I was like, I'm going to go to Africa and like help, you know, women get more water and like figure out their own little businesses and Mm -hmm. uh, started working with the UN and was like, oh no, this is not what I thought it was going to (laughs) be. And then um, worked my way towards actually documentary. I was like, oh, I know how to, I'm going to tell stories about, you know, Africa basically because that was what I was thinking about at the time. (laughs) I was like, oh, documentary. So um, so I started getting into media a little bit more and eventually ended up doing um, my master's in film producing with the hopes of getting primary, you know, primarily focusing on documentary. And then what ended up happening was I fell in love with storytelling. I was like, oh, this is really, this is just cool. And so, um, so uh, during my time at USC film school in LA, I was, uh, I was living with, my my roommate was also in the class with me and she was a great screenwriter. And so we decided that we were going to, we came up with this idea while sitting in traffic on the 405 as one would in LA. Mm -hmm. And we're like, okay, um, so women are, you know, men are always talking about how it's so easy for women to get laid. And we were like, it really isn't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so we start just from there, this idea blossomed and we, um, created this idea called Hannah has a hoe phase and it ended up being my thesis. So she wrote it, what we had to do in film school because it was a producing program. We had to actually option either a script or a treatment and then create like the entire plan for it. Mm Mm-hmm. So it wasn't so, actually producing the film, but it was the writing the script and yes, exactly yeah. working with a, a writer on notes and then mm-hmm. coming up with everything from you know the scheduling, the budget, the cast list, just the entire plan distribution. Was this like so? Or are you actually planning to make this? Uh, or are you you're not expected to in the class? So the actors, are you actually reaching out to them, or is it just kind of your like fairy tale? Like oh, I w- let's get Matt Damon or totally get, yeah. totally it was it was an exercise it wasn't okay. it was something that the program recommended you do realistically because they were like this is great you have done all this work for a year why mm-hmm. not then take it out and do it exactly, yeah. um, no one in my class except us did it wow so I guess not um, yeah. but I do remember our initial wish our dream list because it was like a 6.5 mil at the time that made sense in the industry back in like 20 when was it 20 2009 yeah it made sense to make a 6.5 million dollar film now it doesn't at all i'm mm-hmm. assuming um and we had emma stone i remember nice. was like our, <laughs> our our lead girl yeah. and um i can't remember the rest but probably a lot of snl peeps <laughs> yeah <I bet. laughs> and so um so yeah we you know i i did it as just like a fun exercise and we weren't sure if we wanted to do anything with it and what we did was we started chopping um 
shopping it around in uh, Hollywood and we got some meetings with some agents and they were all like, oh, you guys are great. The script is great and we need men in it. Mm, and we were no like, way. oh, is it? Well, like, that's, no, compl- that's not the idea. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, the way that uh, well, I read about it online a little bit, but you guys kind of pitched it as American Pie for girls. Exactly. Um, which makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so to include guys and more men into that would kind of defeat the purpose of the film to begin with. Yeah, yeah. And let me ask you, like, at this time, so at what point was this? I know that the film ended up releasing in 2012. So at what point are you writing the, the script and, and working on this project? This was in 2008 and 9. And, yeah. like, I, I, if you could remind me, because now, you know, women leads and, and tons of comedy. You've Broad City. You have a lot of Amy Schumer and a lot of comedies mm-hmm. that have women as the main lead and it's following yeah. female characters. Was this like common at the time or this is very new? No, this was um, all we had to compare it to was Sex in the City. We didn't even have like a film version. I think around the time that we were shopping it around, there was this movie. Oh, and I'm going to, I totally don't remember the name with Anna Ferris about her, like, what's your number? I think that's what mm. it was called. And there was a lot of controversy. It wasn't out yet. It was just, um, I think, being made at one of the studios. And there was all this controversy about, like, well, what is a woman's number in terms of, you know, what's the number of guys she can sleep with before she becomes called a whore, (laughs) essentially. (laughs) That's what it was. Yeah, that was what the movie was about. And I guess behind the scenes, it was a lot of old uh, white men debating it. You know, well, what? No, that number is too. That's a very high number. It's like, well, we need women on this table, like yeah. making these decisions, because I don't think you guys know. Yeah. Um, and so that was the only thing I think at the time. I don't remember anything else um, being around, and so we were very much about, you know, we gotta we gotta have more female sex comedies, essentially. It's, yeah. So then you're pitching this, and and they tell you that you need more men in it. Mm-hmm. And, and what's your reaction, and how do you go from there? Yeah, it was really challenging because I think at the time we were really into this one, um, like we were excited to work with this one agent at WME and we were like, oh, are we going to let this go? Like this is, you know, for those who aren't in the industry, I mean, this is a big, this could be a milestone in your career. You know, you can make this movie and then everything else is like, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you're, you're sort of, I don't want to say set, but there's a higher chance of you being set. And that you're early, early in your, your film career as yeah. well. Like that's huge to yeah. be able to have that kind of jump because yeah. some people work their entire life to be able to have that kind of opportunity. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're thinking about potentially kind of giving in to their advice and, and, and following through with adding more. Definitely thought about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to hate on you for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we decided no. You know, yeah. um, a bunch of different things were going on in our personal lives. And uh, my roommate happened to be from New York. That's where she grew up. And so she moved back here. I had to go back home for a little while, which is Lebanon. And eventually, while I was, we were separated, we were like, oh, we really should just make this movie in New York, which is, we had initially written the first draft of the script in New York, but then we changed it to LA because we were like, oh, it's a lot more, you know, they're going to be more excited about LA Mm -hmm. in Hollywood. (laughs) Sure, yeah. Like, it's easier to do. Uh And um, and then we just decided, you know what, we're going to do it and we're going to, have it be micro budget. It was like post Blair Witch and like, it was just like a lot of um, good buzz around micro budgets at the time. So we were like, great, we'll just do it for a hundred thousand. I don't know mm-hmm. how we'll make that happen, but we will. And I was like, oh, a hundred thousand, chop it up into 10 pieces. I just need to get 10 investors, 10,000 each. I got this, yeah. you know, I just like tried to <laughs> break it up into tasks. Yeah, that's actually a yeah. great idea. Did it work? <laughs> it did. Oh, it did. did. Yeah, we had, we ended up having 13 investors and, um, uh-huh. uh, that is not recommended. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of people to manage, yeah, but, but it worked out great. I mean, they were wonderful. And um, for them, you know, they pitched in a small amount. It wasn't it wasn't huge, so it worked mm-hmm. out. I think we also did like one of those um, Kickstarters, but maybe at some point when we needed like cash for like 10,000. But yeah. I mean, that's not, that's that was it's challenging. Yeah, to, I think the hardest anyway. part about, about this like is that at what time were you making this? 2010 now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, 2010. And you, you guys that were making this film weren't like camera operators, didn't have the technical skills. You had the direction, the writing, and, and all of that, and the producing. Yeah, yeah. So 
that that's like the biggest part of the budget right is like getting the the equipment and then paying for the filmmakers and the people to actually create it to pay for the editors to yeah. edit it yeah um so as like a diy type project if i were to try to make a feature film i could probably do it for a lot less so i'm just trying to think of like i guess what were those those big expenses for you and what mm -hmm. was the most challenging part of putting together a film without having the technical experience to yeah. uh, actually operate a camera and, yeah. and shoot the film I think, you know, I mean, we had technical experience, but it would, I would say probably Jamie a lot more, who was my partner on this a lot more than me. I always was like not taking the cinematography classes and I was like, no, I'll just do more producing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but we, we felt confident that we had uh, great people out there who, um, could execute what we wanted, but still at a relatively decent rate that we could afford. A good chunk of it was more like post and distribution. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's, getting that's, into film festivals, you know, that ends up oh costing God. a lot of money. Yeah. Film yeah. festivals cost us, we, we submitted to a lot, like I think 80 film festivals. Wow. And it costs like five grand yeah. amongst all of them because it just adds up. But there's the, the cost to make the film, mm -hmm. which is one thing, the cost to, to edit it, another, and then the cost to distribute it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, even if you spend 30000 on making a film, like nobody sees it yet like to get it out there and that's usually what most especially big feature and, and hollywood budgets like most of it goes towards marketing and promoting the film yeah if people don't know about it it doesn't exist yeah um what were some of the big not technical but what were some of the big challenges of creating this film well um we added in this little challenge of having it be fully female crew so that was fun. <laughs> yeah. How do you go about, because uh, that, that, that's something even I struggle with. And I have been doing this for a while, hiring freelancers. And you, you just don't come across as many women that are in the filmmaking industry. Yeah, we found them. You found them. We found them. We did everything <laughs> to find them. Um, you know, what's great is I think once you get heads of departments that are women, it's a lot easier because they know, you know, they'll, because then they're the ones that are really sourcing or recommending people mm -hmm. in their department and uh, women, you know, I think are pretty good about supporting other women. And, you know, one thing we declared early on was that um, when the time came, if we felt that no woman could fill this job um, the way we wanted it, then yes, we would, we would go to a man. Mm -hmm. um, but we, it just seemed, it made a lot of sense for us to be making a movie about women by women. Um, and the fun, the fun sort of unintended consequence of this was that, you know, uh, the movie is a lot about a woman, uh, who has many encounters with many men. And so we had lots of sex scenes to shoot <laughs> with a lot of different guys yeah. and they would all show up and they were, um, we hadn't even thought about this, but they were really, um, just scared <laughs> to be on set naked with a bunch of women. It's all women. There's no yeah. other men in there to kind and of And we had with. unintentionally reversed, you know, what a woman's experience probably is quite often on set, which is, you know, it's usually a woman running around naked and a lot of, uh, you mm -hmm. know, grips and whatnot. Yeah, around. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, we realized that only once we were actually shooting the scene, we're like, oh. How interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not intended, but sort of fun. <laughs> yeah. Is this something that you thought you were going to continue to do? And and once finishing this film and putting it out there, did you say like, yeah, like I want to keep doing this? Or were you having doubts and, and second thoughts about filmmaking? Um, it's a great question. I was definitely having doubts. I think uh, my body was telling me a lot of things like I had not been listening to my body. This is why I'm now doing what I do, which is that I, uh, you know, you sleep four hours a night. I had my, I was sleeping with my phone under my pillow because I'm the person that when, you know, stuff's going wrong, they have to call. And so I never really, I think, fell asleep. I was just taking little cat naps going like, what's the next thing that's going to blow up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when when you're on low budget um, productions, the food isn't necessarily, um, you know, organic and gluten free. It's going to be like burritos from like the deli, yeah, pizza. Uh, pizza if you're lucky. Yeah. Um, and so when you're living a lifestyle like that, I at some point my body was like, nope, this is this is not sustainable. How are you going to be a mother and do this? Mm -hmm. um, how are you going to have a family? And um, and so I started to reevaluate, well, okay, what is it that I really love about this and what is not working for me? 
And so I think working with women's stories and being um, inspired by women and, you know, continuing on the theme of, I think, uh, sensuality and feminism, like all of that stuff still moved with me into the work that I do now. It just had a slightly different um, way of presenting itself. Yeah. Was there was there a catalyst or tipping point for you? Because four hours of sleep a night, (laughs) there's only so long that you can do that. And at one point, did you say... I need to make a change. I need to kind of reassess my priorities here. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, so, um, once we finished the film, I wasn't, you know, I actually wasn't sure then that, okay, this is done for me. I, um, got a job at an advertising agency. So I was like production managing there and still had my production company and working on basically, you know, post and, um, getting the film into film festivals, which, you know, those people who know, it's a quite a few years of just that after the film is done. Mm-hmm. Um, and so as I was doing all of that, I also was taking on a couple of other little like low budge things here and there on the weekends. And um, every time I would, I'm like, oh my God, because here was the thing. It was like the advertising agency um, was, I didn't want to do commercials. Like I don't care at yeah. all. Like creatively speaking, I was, but the check was nice <laughs> yeah, you know right. um and that w- that's what kept me doing the other things but then i would yeah. show up on these like small indie films with a lot of directors and actors who you know you just have to like babysit and egos and, and i was mm. just like i'm getting paid i think there was like one job where i like produced a whole um like second unit shoot or something was going on. i can't remember it was like four days and i was like the entire thing i worked for like two weeks i got like 500 dollars or something and i was like I'm done with this. Mm-hmm. Like, I I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. And so at the same time, I just stopped the advertising. I stopped the, I closed my production company. I just like went all out. Like, wow. I was like, I'm done That's with terrifying. all of this. Yeah. I was like, this is <laughs> the end. And you're living in New York. Yes. And I'm living in New York. Did you have a little bit of runway? Did you kind yes, of, you plan, okay, you planned it out smart. I did. I had some savings. Yeah. I had, I knew I had like, you know, worst case scenario. I had my family to fall back on. It wasn't, you know. Uh, I can't consider myself like, oh my God, the most courageous hero of all. But um, what I will say was courageous is that in having to uh, make the decision of changing my career, I also had to let go of my um, my U.S. visa because I was here um, on a visa. Oh, wasn't, yeah, yeah cause I'm. And so that was actually the hardest part. It wasn't so much, oh, am I going to have enough money? Mm-hmm. Or it was more, oh, I need to leave the U.S. Like, like no, I sort of like New York and I'm yeah. having fun here and I don't necessarily want to go back home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I also knew that I couldn't, it wasn't sustainable. Yeah. yeah. H- have you always been into like entrepreneurial and spirit and in terms of reading self-help books and self-improvement type books? I Yes and no. Uh, I never... I always, you know, I had my own production company, so I was an entrepreneur, essentially, even in in the film world. And being a producer is like the best, um, really the the best training for it because Mm -hmm. you're working with money, you're working with big teams um, that sometimes it's more challenging than having, you know, a couple of employees because it's constant, you know, turnaround and huge teams that you're working with. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I, it didn't feel uh, challenging at all for me to go, okay, well, now I'm going to start another business. I was like, oh, okay, here's just another way of doing what I was already doing. Mm-hmm. Um, what And what I loved to do was I loved nutrition and holistic um, healing. I was always geeking out on that just through my own journey with my body and my health. And so I was always, I was sort of termed Nurse Nadia in um, my uh, friends and family circle. So they'd mm-hmm. always be like, okay, what do I need to take for this? Or what do I, you know, and I always had an answer. So I always was really inclined to work in, I guess, the, the world of health and healing. And so it made sense for me to go out and um, get certified as a holistic health coach, which is the next step I took. I basically was like, all right, I'm going to do this. You are, in essence, starting over. Yeah. Yeah. Burned all my budgets. <laughs> so many budgets. Um, burned them all. I was like, yeah. Um, well, what... I, it was, mine is an interesting story because I started my business while I was on the road. So we were, me and my partner were nomadic and um, hopping around from one awesome place to another. And mm-hmm. it was early on in the relationship. So, you know, you're in honeymoon phase, which means you're more inspired and you're more excited. And um, it's really, the, the beautiful thing is it's like, it's really easy to start an online business in terms of you don't need to have a certain amount of capital. Um, you don't need to rent a place out, uh, 
you just need your laptop and good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so that's really great. And initially what I did, I mean, on a very pragmatic level was when I officially opened the doors to my business, I started off by just using social media to essentially, um, advertise that I was offering a few like scholarship, um, I think I positioned it something like that. So scholarship um, uh, slots mm -hmm. in coaching um, in my business. And so you could apply. And so a bunch of people applied and um, a lot of them were good fits. And we, I basically gave them three free sessions. Mm. So um, what I did, a lot of coaches, what they'll do is they'll do one free session. Yeah. But, and then what they do is they'll do like what they are like, oh, I'm doing a 30 day challenge, one person a day who want, you know, here's my calendar, book a spot. Mm -hmm. And this is a great way for you to get better as a coach yeah. um, without feeling the pressure of, oh my God, someone paid me. What if I suck? Exactly. And, <laughs> and what is it? This is like a 30 minute Skype session or 60 minute Skype session, something yeah, like that. Exactly. Okay. And um, I do 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. I some other people do 30. Yeah. I don't know how they get anything done. Yeah, I know. Come on. What do you do? I like, I like, <laughs> I I like spaciousness, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then not feeling constricted to right. ever getting everything done in, in 30 yeah. minutes is kind of tough. Yeah. And so, um, so I remember being like, yeah, I don't know about this, like 30 people. That just feels like a lot. I'd rather have 10 people, but each give them three sessions. And what ended up being mm. beautiful about that is that there was enough space for us to develop a certain relationship and a trust. And so a few of them became paying clients. So oh. I sold them my six month program and um, we started working together. And then it was just, you know, you start trying on different things. You know, there's like webinars is one way to do it. People sign up, you tell them about all the awesome things that you do mm -hmm. and then you go hey here's a discount come sign up you know yeah um, yeah I love that idea just the even the coaching because that's something I haven't thought about doing and maybe I will eventually mm -hmm. as I do less and less client work and go more into um, creating my own content I have had people ask me uh, if I'm like offering mentoring or anything like that and at this time I'm like it's, just, it's a little it seems a little bit too early for me to get into that not that I couldn't do it um, as in I'm like I'm focused on so many other things mm -hmm. and I'm like I'm just a little bit overwhelmed with doing stuff now as it is and once things slow down I'll certainly do that were you like scared like worried as you said that you may give people the wrong advice and you may be bad at it because like that's <laughs> yeah. a tough thing to do these are important questions that you're helping people work through yeah um totally I mean we all I think we all have that and initially what I what I realized was I was operating very much in my head and uh, when those questions come up, it's always ego, right? It's about, you, you start to make it about you. And one thing my partner shared with me, who's, he's a, a life coach and- mm -hmm. um, Jacob Sokol was Jacob, on the show. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, all right, so many people are um, know him. And yeah. uh, he shared with me a really beautiful piece of advice that I constantly come back to, which is when you start to have those thoughts, you're making this about you. And you are here in service to the other person and so you need to always go back to them the focus is on them and so what would happen is in a way the same way that you sit down you know for a seated meditation and thoughts come through and you go okay i see this thought and now i release you um thoughts will come through as you're coaching you're like oh my god what did i just say was that totally weird mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to go i see you and i release you and go again take that focus back from oh what does this say about me to okay, what is this person saying right now, right? Yeah. Which is part of being a good listener, which is about 80% of being a good coach. Mm. It's like, you know, actually listening. Mm -hmm. Because so many people, um, I remember, I always think about Oprah, who said that after every single person she's interviewed, no matter how big they are, if they were presidents or they were pop stars, or they always like, the cameras turn off and, and, and they turn around and they're like, was I okay? <laughs> That's so funny. And she's like, what I realized is that people just want to be seen. And when they mm -hmm. feel really seen and feeling heard is an, you know, another way of being seen. It's just the other way. Mm -hmm. um, you, you feel a lot safer. You feel really good. And lately I've been geeking out a lot more on like the neuroscience of a lot of this stuff because I see it experientially, you know, happening, but I don't understand what's going on in the brain. And I like, I'm a sciencey person. And at the end mm -hmm. of the day, I really like to understand, well, what's, what's happening behind the scenes. And, um, 
as I'm learning more and more from these people who are really good at what they do in therapy and psychiatry, I'm realizing that there is a lot of work done on this and that most of your nervous system really slows down and starts to feel safe and goes out of like that fight or flight mode that we have when we're like stressed or anxious or scared. We go back into a place of regulation and balance when we feel heard or seen. Mm. So that actually really is like most of the work. (laughs) (laughs) Just being able to listen and to be able to let them know that you're here and to, Mm -hmm. to help them work through their uh, the challenges that they're they're going through. Yeah. What would you say are the, the biggest challenges that you've seen? And you, all your clients are women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, I imagine their challenges are a bit, bit different than men might have. What are some of the common themes that you see? Gosh, there's a lot of them. I would say a big one is, of course, just not not being friends with your body. So feeling like your body is something you have to manage. And sort of a very top-down approach, right? Like this is what we've been um, fed over and over again by media, diet industry, everywhere. It's like fashion industry, like get it in control, get it into those jeans, get it, you know, Mm -hmm. lose the muffin top, do that. Um, And same thing in in, in the patriarchy too, in the sense that like, we have to again show up a certain way no matter whether we are you know ovulating luteal bleeding doesn't matter and so we have to there's all these mechanisms out there to control the body like okay here comes the tampon like make Mm -hmm. it pretend it's not there there's like a lot of different um, things out there that have us doing that even you know numbing out Uh, headaches right like what do we do or women who don't um you know who have issues with their period have to go on the pill but that's really just like a mask to cover up the symptoms but it doesn't solve the initial problem Mm -hmm. so what we're running around doing in life is instead of listening to our bodies we're caffeinating we're numbing out through painkillers or you know anything else that you numb out with Mm -hmm. um and um and we're also you know increase taking in external hormones that aren't created by our bodies and so there's this very much this like like top-down approach to the body and to managing it which causes this rift between um, women and their bodies and so what we're doing is we're trying to remove all of those things listen to what's actually going on which initially can suck right because when you're like oh I'm not going to take the Advil I'm not going to take the you know birth control pill and I'm not um, you know, going to do any of the things that um, I've gotten so used to doing as a crutch, everything shows up. Mm-hmm. And so that's a really good time to have a coach because it's really scary and overwhelming when you're on your own. You probably just call your doctor back up and go like, actually, I'm going to go back on the pill. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to need those Then you go to Dwayne Reed. You're like, and I'm going to get some Advil. You know, you do all the, and then Starbucks for the coffee, right? It's all set up perfectly yeah. to, to, to just manage your, your pain and your, your body's way of speaking to you. And so we, re, you know, we strip all of that and get to the core of, well, what's actually going on? What's your body saying? And let's address it from the core and get it actually solved mm-hmm. as opposed to cover it up. It seems like there's a lot of uh, overlapping between that and minimalism. And I think when you look at the core mm-hmm. of it, and when I was when we went out and I interviewed uh, with Josh and Ryan like 20, 30 people for our, our documentary, like the one thing that was always the 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 tipping point that started everything was that they started asking questions mm. um, because they weren't happy, they were discontent. There were certain things in their life that they that they didn't um, weren't f- feeling fulfilled. Mm. So for them to be able to ask these questions like, "What do I really want? What am I feeling?" Mm-hmm. It was bringing in a sense of awareness for Mm -hmm. them. And I think that that is such an important thing is that most of us don't ask the questions just because it's easier not to. It's easier to just keep going forward, whether it's climbing up the corporate ladder, we kind of distract ourselves with unimportant things because the important questions are, Mm -hmm. um, I think, a little bit too heavy for us to handle. Yeah, I would, um, I'll add to that, that a lot of women come to me saying, I want to, I, I want to connect to my inner voice. I want to connect to my, my intuition and my wisdom and my, my power as a woman. And, um, I go, all right, that's great. We can totally do that. 
And just know that your intuition and sort of your, uh, your body wisdom speaks in a whisper and many times is very inconvenient. <laughs> so you may be making really great money at a job. You may be like living a very convenient life, but if you're unhappy and you're like, well, I'm trying to figure out like, what is my true purpose? And I want to connect more to my inner voice. And then your inner voice is like, quit your job, sell it all and, you know, you know, put all your stuff in a backpack and and go traveling and that person might be like, "Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know if I'm ready for it." And so you have to also accept that that path is not it's a bit more uncomfortable. It's a little bit more inconvenient. And so many times what happens is women hear that voice. Um they pretend they don't because they're not ready to make those changes. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel right for them yet, um, and so I think yeah, you know whether you're trying to adopt a minimalist lifestyle or you're trying to connect deeper to you, to your body as a woman, it's all the same thing. We're trying to um, remove the static or noise, which is what I call it, um, from our you know our like ecosystem space. Yeah, yeah our energy field like oh i'm like a two woo woo but like, <laughs> yeah. um and not the place for it here but you know it's just it, in in your space you want to remove all that static the messaging the layers all that stuff that's coming at you that's like you should do this you should do that and what, it's only once you remove it because those, those come those messagings or me, those messages come as like in a bullhorn right they're like screaming at you it's like everywhere on the billboards on the mm-hmm. you know um whereas like the whisper of like your connection to something bigger you're not going to hear any of that when there's like all that built all the different bullhorn (laughs) screaming happening so you gotta get rid of that do you think it's harder in new york totally yeah new york is like the center (laughs) of all of it it's madness (laughs) but that's also why if you get you know i think the most enlightened people are in new york too because those who are able to maintain a lifestyle of connection and um spirituality within a place that constantly tests you (laughs) yeah then you know what you're good if you can spiritually make it in new york you can make it anywhere (laughs) yeah yeah um were there any early wins for you uh when you started to coach and you started to build this business that you have now where you felt like yeah i could actually do this this is this is something that i could feasibly um build upon yeah, I mean, I think every getting every new client was a win. Mm-hmm. You know, like, yay, more money. Like, <laughs> yeah. I can pay rent. Um, and people want to do this because I love doing it. You know, it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just, oh, hey, I can pay rent. It's always a good thing. It's, it's filling as well. I, yeah. I think that's so important is yeah. that it's one thing to create a business and say create a product, whatever it is that sells and does well and makes you money. But if you're not fulfilled by it, if, if there's nothing but money in it for you, uh, I don't think you, it can take you very far, right? Yeah, like my favorite, favorite, favorite. I mean, I love working with one-on-one so much, but really the the thing I love to do most just because it's so instantly satisfying is my Embody class, which I teach in New York and, and sometimes travel with, right? Because it's a one-hour class and we're dancing the entire time and the idea is to deepen them into their body more and more. And by the end... I just, I get to like witness all these women like laying down on the floor, having just danced their hearts out. So connected to themselves, uh, many very emotional. And I'm like, oh man, this is amazing. Like I just did this, you <laughs> yeah. know, and they're feeling this way and they didn't feel this way an hour ago. All it took was an hour. Yeah. And so that to me is the most, I think, potent version of the results that make me so happy when I see women so connected to their bodies. And then, of course, there's the you know other versions that I see over Skype. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Just as important. Those are kind of peak experiences where you have this connection, whether mm-hmm. it's with 20 people or yeah. one, and it's to build upon that. I'm still figuring out uh, the character of my business. So I feel like in the first few years of entrepreneurship, um, sometimes you have to really be clear about positioning yourself. And, um, I think that I will say that's been an area that's been a little bit confusing for me. Cause on the one hand, I feel like I want very high lux boutique experience. 
um, which I create for a lot of women. And on the other hand, um, my like socialist spirit is like, but I want it to be accessible to everyone. Mm. And so this is a piece that um, behind the scenes, I'm still working with someone who supports me and my business strategy. We're figuring that piece out. Um, but what I do know for sure is, and that hasn't been a question since day one, is that uh, something like Embody the Dance Class, I want it to be everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, the more women can be dancing and feeling connected, the better life is going to be for everyone, especially the men, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Which is what we want. And so um, I am starting an Embody certification. Actually, this year is going to be the first time we run it um, so that we can train other women to run these classes and do it in such a way that they can make it their own. So there'll be certain things that are standard no matter where you are. But then, you know, if they're coaches, they can bring it into a longer you know, workshop, um, that they do with their own, you know, their genius. And then maybe you're a yoga teacher and you want to start to bring that into your yoga studio and have it be like a special um, class that you offer on the weekends. If you are, um, an energy healer, like there's so many different ways in which you can start to incorporate it. And that's the idea. I want it to just spread because I can only be in so many places at the same time. You, you touched on an interesting point, which is something that I'm struggling with. Not struggling, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out is what should my audience be? Like, who am I talking to? Mm-hmm. Uh, and for you, it's you've like at least have uh have it down to women (laughs) but then i imagine there's a subset of women who would be more interested in your work than others and it's like how specific do you go and and obviously that's a hard thing to define and and does your audience naturally come towards you or do you have to actually set the the messaging and i guess like put the lures out there to catch the the people who should be hearing your message yeah it's a it's a great question i think it's it's a little bit of both (laughs) cheating with that answer but you know your essence is going to naturally pull in certain types of people so i definitely you know, I'm the type of person on my on my blog. I do a lot of cursing. I'm just speaking my mind. I think that's why a lot of people like to follow me. It's like I don't. I I, I can think outside of the box. You know, I'll think outside of the box and say it, and I don't really care. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so I think uh, by me creating that content too, so it comes from my spirit. But because I create that content, more people are reading it. The more you're gonna get those types of people drawn in. So usually, my, you know, the profile of the woman that um, I work with is one who is very similar to me, who uh, was a very, you know, overachieving, driven um, go-getter, and who at some point or currently is like just super burnt out and going like, oh, I don't know about this path. Like this is not really working for me. Mm -hmm. And I want to be, you know, I want to feel vibrant and alive and connected. And I want to be that woman that walks into the room where like all the heads turn and they're like, wow, I want what she's got. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, All women really desire that. And, um, And usually when you are working really hardcore, you lose that connection, you lose that vibrancy. And so they're coming to me going, oh, you know, sometimes it's specific to issues with their health. Sometimes it's um, specific to hormones. Sometimes it's none of those. They've got their health. They've figured it out. They've worked with a nutritionist and a health coach, but they're just coming to me to get more connected to the energetic and emotional piece of their body and their sensuality. So it really just depends, but that's generally the type of woman that um, will show up. And the woman that I speak to because you know she's listening to the experience that I've had and she's going oh look this woman who was a film producer and slept four hours a night and ate burritos is now honoring all her food intolerances but doing it in a way that still feels nourishing and pleasure filled where she's mm-hmm. not depriving herself and you know she's not going on a diet or I don't believe there's in so any much of that stuff. Guilt involved and I don't totally. know if it's because I grew up Catholic but I think that <laughs> people get it anyway I yeah. think that uh and and it follows you around minimalism, like getting rid of my stuff. And then I thought and it helped me massively, but then now I struggle with the guilt of buying stuff. Right. And if I buy a new lens or a new camera, I'm like, Oh man, I don't know. Should I do it? And then yeah. you just like, then you have actually repositioned. It's always about guilt. <laughs> and like, I guess, how do you live a life where yeah. you can, you can eliminate guilt? And I guess, do you, do you feel guilt in your life? And does that guide you in any way? And how do you control it? 
I love that you bring this up because it's so important. Yeah. And uh, yes, every all women have guilt, and it's it's usually around sex or food, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. because again, those that's where we get the strongest messages. And um, I would say most of, you know most of the time, I've gotten really good about um, not having guilt around um, food and you know, being unapologetically sensual. Like those pieces don't feel difficult to me. I, I would say I still probably have guilt around like prioritizing my time and like, yeah. you know, other things. But in the world that, you know, the stuff that I, te- that I work with women on, I, I feel, I feel pretty good about it. But when they come to me, I, I simply explain to them, I say, listen, we are, I really truly believe that the best way that we can get motivated is by pleasure, right? Like who doesn't want to follow pleasure? Mm-hmm great (laughs) so every decision especially when it comes to food is either about long-term pleasure or short-term short-term pleasure and you can decide there's no right or wrong so when you are sitting at a restaurant and you know that they have one of those the best desserts ever and you're like oh man i'm not gonna be back here for like a year short-term pleasure is gonna win Mm -hmm. you're gonna go yep Thank you. I will have that whatever milfoy termisu fancy deliciousness. Yeah. <laughs> and I may feel sort of crappy after because I have a dairy and gluten intolerance. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I have a few different tools that, you know, you I work in to mm-hmm. minimize that pain. Yeah. And end of the day, if I die tomorrow, I'll know I had that beautiful <laughs> dessert. <You'll rest> easy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then there's times where you choose a long-term pleasure, but you're still choosing pleasure. It's just when you're eating that salad or you're, you know, um, being really good about removing the foods that aren't, you know, that are toxic to your system. What you're doing is you're choosing energy. You're choosing vitality. You're choosing um, to be more focused when you go back to work after lunch and you're not in that like 3 p.m. like, oh my God, I just had a pizza for lunch Mm -hmm. um, energy. And instead you're like, I'm rocking this. And so you're prioritizing, it's just a different type of pleasure that you're prioritizing. So you're never depriving yourself because whenever we think of it as depriving ourselves, that's when we're like, well, no one wants to deprive themselves. (laughs) That sucks. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, why? Yeah. It's almost like this is a mind trick. It's just a way to uh, reposition in your mind how you approach something mm-hmm. like um, a treat or, or a dessert. Yeah. And it's not just dessert, you know. I mean, that's an example I'm using just because I happen to have an issue with dairy, <laughs> gluten, eggs, the whole situation. But, you know, it could be anything that specifically... Because I think it's, you know, this is the other piece that... Um, people always forget it's like we're not in the 90s anymore it's not about calories and sugar and you know it's 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 about um getting really clear on what's toxic for you and what's you what works for your body which is going to be totally different than for someone else's so you've been doing this for a while Uh, i imagine that you've gotten some criticism over the years whether it's just like random people on youtube saying stuff or whatever uh how do you deal with criticism and how do you view it I got to say, I haven't, I, I got one email once in response. That's to it? That's some, all you got? That's all that's I got. That's amazing. And in that moment, I was like, I have arrived. Oh, really? Um, I'm sort of disappointed that I haven't had more because yeah. I do talk about a lot of stuff that I can see, you know, would trigger a lot of people, but I don't know. It, it hasn't really happened. And um, That's great. Maybe it's, you know, I do truly believe that if you're someone who that, like, that's a fear of yours, more of that's going to come your way right? because it's part of like the cosmic lesson that you need to learn. Whereas I don't really, I mean, like, I don't think I really care if some, I'm like, you know, I actually think it's sort of cool. I'm like, oh yeah, you care enough that you're like upset. Like, I don't know. I don't like reading reviews (laughs) because like putting minimalism out there, like people write reviews. I I just assume it's going to be the worst case scenario. Yeah. And I just, and I'm my worst critic. So I could probably pick out the holes better than a movie critic could. Um, so I tend to not to even read them. I'm like, ah, it's not even worth it for me. Cause if it's good, it's, I'm going to feel good. If it's bad, it's just going to ruin my day for the totally. next like three days. But you, like, I just stumbled across some like Netflix reviews and it's just hilarious. I think it's like the crazy people it's, I'm okay with. Yeah. It's uh there's people that say, well, you can't be a minimalist. Like these people get $200 haircuts and they wear like nice hair product. I'm like, did you, you don't even that's not it like you could wear a hair product it doesn't matter how expensive your haircut is you can be a minimalist yeah um that to me is easy but it's like some of the feedback that's like cutting at 
I guess maybe some of my own insecurities about um, where I think I could have done better, which obviously you can always do better, mm. which affect me a little bit more. And it's just something that I, I continue to work on. But I, I think the more and more I release content and put stuff out there, it's I, I have the same mentality of you where it's like, you almost kind of encourage it where I'm like, come on, like say, say something <laughs> shitty about it because no. I really don't care. Because as long as I really love what I created and I, I really like it and I know that there's going to be a core audience of people that will like it, then I think that's all that matters. Yeah. And you reminded me actually, you know, I may have not gotten criticism in my coaching business, but or so far, but, uh, with our film, we definitely got a bunch of reviews that were like, no, <laughs> oh, no. I think it was like village. Vo- we were very excited because we got written up in the village voice and it was bad. <laughs> oh, no, really? You read it. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause we weren't getting, you know, I mean, we're pretty small, small films. So we yeah. were very excited by anyone writing anything, yeah. even if it was bad. <laughs> you guys like have a party about a bad review. Like, yeah, we did yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it does suck. And I think I'm always reminded of, and I may again, totally slaughter this, but I think it's Theodore Roosevelt who has this quote about the man in the arena. And it's like, it's a very long quote, so I definitely don't remember it, but it's along the, you know, it's, it's talking about the fact that, yeah, it's really easy for those who are like on the sidelines to go, Oh, look at that thing that they missed and look at this thing. But it's really the person who's in the boxing ring, like getting beat up, but trying, um, that is the hero. And I think, you know, making something like a hundred thousand dollar film, all female crew getting a dist- you know, actually getting distribution, having there be like pretty, pretty decent actors, like all of these are victories. And then there's people who are sitting at home, you know, they always talk about how like people who are like art critics or film critics are the ones who like really deeply desire to actually do it, but they like don't have it in them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so yeah. they're like, all right, we're just going to sit around and like, and write about it. Yeah. And just shit on other people's work. And it's yeah. like, well, how about you try it? And let's yeah. see how that goes. I think that it does, it does change your perspective. And I could see even a younger version of myself very quickly looking at a film or very quickly look reading a book and saying I could have done it better or that's this is yeah. that was a shit movie and I, I that's what I struggle with where it's like I don't want to be a critic or criticize somebody but I think you have to do stand for your ideas and at one totally. point totally yeah at what point does that line you cross the line I think it has to do with when you're when you are critiquing because I'm I'm a bit I think it's important to critique but there's a way to critique that is respectful and humane yeah. <laughs> and um, that also it still has the lens of compassion and understanding that everyone is doing really the best that they can mm-hmm. you know in their work as a human and just in all aspects and so yeah. We do, you know, sometimes we forget that. We start to get a little... mm. Yeah, just be a good person. Because a lot of times you don't see... You're not seeing the people behind it. And that's where you get these anonymous YouTube comments and anonymous comments online where people will either troll or just like be the worst version of themselves possible when you would never say that in real life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what are those... I don't know. How how does anyone have time for that much trolling? They must not have... I don't... I mean, I don't know. I don't want to assume. But so I just go all right well if you have that much time to do that i'm i'm busy off trying something new even if i messed up in this last thing yeah exactly and that's that's what drives me too is that even if i did make the last thing i put out was shitty it doesn't matter because i just made something today that i'm going to put out and then it it almost covers yeah (laughs) totally but um all right, that's interesting. So let's get to the four phases of embodiment i want to hear about that okay and this is for women only or okay men can't do this or is this? Um, a little. There's one phase that we're gonna have to remove okay. <laughs> for the men. Got it. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll go through it super quick and um, and explain how the men can be involved in all of this. Okay. So basically, what um, what I realized after doing you know different work, the health coaching, the movement piece, my own experiences is that you know ultimately you know, when the desire is to get deeply embodied and to be connected to your body voice, what you have to start off doing is you always have to start with the, the physical body. Mm-hmm. So you can't go, oh, I would like to connect to my inner voice and my intuition and my da 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 when you still have basic issues like migraines, stomach aches, you know, the whole lot. So when women come to me, Um, we always, we go through these four phases and sometimes we go back and forth through them. We're not swimming necessarily in a very like linear way. We're going up and down. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but essentially what, um, what we do is we start off with removing the static, removing the noise. I think about it like your body voice is on a radio, um, channel Mm -hmm. and you're like one knob off. So you're like, I hear the song, but there's like all the static in the middle. And so we're trying to remove that. So that could be, you know, for some people it's as simple as I don't drink enough water. For some people it's, um, you know, metal, uh, metal detox because they eat too much sushi. <laughs> like yeah. for some people it's uh, figuring out what their food intolerances are, which nowadays is a lot more because thanks Monsanto and Roundup, like mm-hmm. we all have some issues with our stomachs. And, um, and so we handle all of that first, get them really mastered as to how to, how, what they need to take out and what they need to add in. Phase two is just understanding, starting to learn the language. So now that the static is removed, you're really starting to, there's a back and forth. There's sort of like, you know, the um, source and the consequence of, oh, when I eat this, I get a migraine. When I don't eat that, I don't have enough energy when I, you know, and so on and so forth. So phase two is can, really, yeah. Can I cut in real quick? Yep. Um, and cause that's something that struck a chord with me, but, and uh, this is my question is I, I guess, our bodies change over time as well. So you always have to be in tune and figuring it out because recently I started to develop an intolerance to beer, which was the most, this is the saddest moment of my life. I love beer so much. And then all of a sudden I started to notice that I would get headaches when I would drink beer. And you're Mm -hmm. right. Like that's one of those things that's, it's, it's very hard to pick out because if you go out for a night, you usually are drinking beer. You might have wine, you might bring hard alcohol into it. Hard to really identify. But then once I started to realize I have drink one beer just after uh, work or hanging out, playing video games, one beer, the Mm -hmm. next morning I wake up with a migraine, with a headache. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, this, this is, this gotta be the beer. And then I stopped drinking beer for two months. Uh, it started out as just like a one month practice and then two months went by I went to a Yankees game and I was like all right let me just do a Miller Lite let me do a light beer I just want to try it and it's part of the game and then that night I woke up at three in the morning felt like I was going to throw up I was over top of the toilet and then um I then the whole next day I was hung over like hell uh it it was just amazing for me to identify that and depressing at the same time. I know, I know. But you're right. So I guess is that, is that my question being you have to continually keep this process of awareness to understand when certain things you should be eliminating or bringing into your life. Yeah. So, I mean, we go through a very specific elimination protocol that is, you, know, you take stuff out for a few weeks. You start slowly bring one in at a time so that you can observe how your body responds to it. So we have like, a, a sort of system set up, mm-hmm. but it is an ongoing practice. Like there are times where you can um, not have an intolerance anymore, and there's times when you develop a new one. And one of the theories for that is that because we eat so much crap, <laughs> essentially, and breathe mm-hmm. so much crap, we have started to get micro perforations in our gut lining, and so many things that we eat then get released outside of our digestive tract and um, are picked up by the immune system. And then the immune system flags it as foreign intruder. So they think it's like a virus. And so your body responds to it the same way it would a virus, which is, you know, your histamine levels go up, um, you, which is part of why you could get, you know, some people get like sinus and headaches and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you could have issues with your digestion directly. Um, so there's a lot of different things that happen, but essentially you can, if you have those micro perforations and you're eating something, continuously it may become an intolerance so it just really Mm. it's an ongoing fluid process and everyone's trying to figure it out right now like in the in the health and wellness industry no one really knows what's going on there's a lot of mystery involved there is because i mean there's clearly a rise it's not like you know some at some point people were like oh this is just bs and it's like "Eh, no if a lot of people are doing it it's Mm -hmm. probably and everyone feels every client that comes to me feels better when they're not eating gluten yeah they just do Mm -hmm. so I can, you know, I don't want people not to be eating bread. It's not in my philosophy. I'm all about <laughs> yeah. the toast um, it, and French baguettes, man. Oh my God. But there's clearly something going on. And so, yeah. so, you know, I, I got to tell you with the beer, I, I'd be curious if you try, um, have you tried gl- the gluten-free beers too and um, seen how you feel then? I don't know if I have though. There's I some eat good ones. bread. I eat a lot of bread. <laughs> And I'm it's a big fine. bread guy. Yeah, I can eat like loaves of bread and I'm never hungover from bread. Yeah. Um, but I would, I should try that. Cider is fine. I can drink cider. Corona too is primarily Ooh, corn. I have heard. Yeah, I, I haven't really, I wanted to do that and like say I'll, each night I'll do a different beer. Maybe yeah. it'd be better to space it out to give my body some time to yeah, like get back seriously. to the ground zero and not like kill myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, but 
so yeah i think i'm gonna do a little experiment maybe try stout maybe try corona that, yeah that's something i've thought yeah. of but i haven't and i don't think i've done the gluten-free beer so yeah yeah I'll definitely but it's hard because i have looked up online and there's so many ingredients and so many different things in beer you can't really it's hard to say yeah. it's one thing versus another totally totally yeah and that's part of the experimentation process yeah. is starting to figure out well what is actually going on and why is it that way um but ultimately, what you do know, based on experience, not because, uh, you know, a doctor took your blood and said, this is a problem, you know, I don't feel great the mm -hmm. next day, so I'm probably not going to do it. Yeah. Unless I really have time to just hang out and have a migraine. Um, did we do phase three? Was that we have not. Okay. We have phase not. Phase three. So phase three is when we get into specific to a feminine body, which okay. is um, handling, we're going deeper, uh, we're past the the physical symptoms and we're going into the hormonal uh, body because mm -hmm. that's a piece the endocrine system which is responsible for all, all our hormones is you can't see it and so it's it's not tangible and a mm -hmm. lot of women don't know how to connect to that part of them and so a lot of the work we do there is supporting your hormones because most women are not in a good place and then um, getting really uh, connected what we started the conversation today with which is you know getting connected to your your phases of your cycle and you know what are you best at um, and how do you exercise at different times of the month which are very different mm -hmm. for women you're not supposed to be exercising like you're not supposed to be doing high impact stuff at certain times of the month other times it's great to do high impact and you know guys it's the same thing you show up you do the same thing every day it's all good just like bouncing against the wall <laughs> throwing <laughs> weights around you know whatever you need to do <laughs> yeah it's the same but for women we have to be we're really nuanced and we're a lot more rhythmic and so we have to actually adjust the way that we eat the way that we exercise the way that we sleep and the tasks that we manage throughout the month and so this phase with my clients is very much about you know getting them familiar with this philosophy and having them realize that, you know, their their period, their cycle is not a curse, which is what a lot of uh, women think, and that instead it's a superpower. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like that in 2017, <laughs> but it really is. And so we get them connected back to that. And then eventually, once we've handled all of those pieces, we can connect to the whisper. We can connect to the energetic and emotional body. We, I may do like certain chakra work if people feel blocked in certain areas. This is where some of the breath and what I call moving meditations um, come in. We meditate in a way that is uh, more feminine, that isn't seated, where we're actually moving and getting into our curves, getting connected to our senses. And uh, that's the piece I do a lot more also in the uh, in-person events and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that's the slow deepening into, you know, that connection because you can't go, all right, I'm going to sit down and do moving meditations and feel super connected. If you have a stomach ache, right? right. You are going to be so busy trying to either pretend it does, it's not happening or get up and go, oh, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. So we have to address that physical piece before we can get into the emotional and energetic. I, what advice would you give somebody who's um, trying to build their own business or build um, you know, something from scratch? What have you learned that you think would be valuable? Have savings. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, true. I see a lot lately. I've been seeing a lot of rhetoric of, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, if you are courageous and believe in yourself, it doesn't matter if you're like in debt and da da da. You can follow your dreams and uh, all will, the universe has your back and all is going to work out. Um, it may take a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and life is expensive these days. Mm -hmm. And um, I do think it's really important to understand that a lot of the people you see out there who are doing amazing have probably been doing this for a really, really long time and probably done a few different iterations of their business or maybe had other businesses completely that failed mm -hmm. um, and that they learned, you know, they learned along the way. So if you're choosing to quit your nine to five and follow your dreams, I'm all for it. But I like to balance out, you know, impulsiveness with a certain amount of game plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and part of that is your financial game plan, because in order for you to do the best work, and I can speak to this because I did not do this, um, <laughs> in order for you to do the best work and really serve your clients and bring out your creative genius as much as possible, you need to feel, your nervous system has to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And um, for different people, that's gonna be at different levels of debt. 
Some people have the capacity to be like, I'm $20,000 in debt and all's good, you know? And then some people, if they don't pay off, if they, you know, can't pay off every single credit card in that month, are freaking out Mm -hmm. and that's because we each have our own money stories we each have our own um our nervous system has is wired a certain way because of different trauma that we've had growing up so all of those things are um are need to be taken into account so if you know that you're someone who doesn't function very well and goes into complete shutdown or freeze when you start to freak out about money then it's going to be really hard to be uh, creative in your business and therefore you're just going to feel like you're stuck Mm-hmm. And so it's really good to have a part-time job or to be doing something um, that just at least has you feeling semi-calm. And again, that's going to depend on each person. But I think it's important to, when you are making a big step like that, to evaluate, okay, what can my nervous system handle right now? Part of what I learned was that in not having, you know, running out of savings pretty soon and, and feeling um, very, having just a lot of issues around money, I also had to grow and so it was really good for me to start to readjust how much debt I could handle before I went into shutdown. Mm -hmm. Um, But if I went back and did it differently, I would probably be like, all right, maybe a little bit more of um, another job that I could you know, bring in a little bit of money from. So when I have a month where I don't sign up a client, I don't feel like, oh my God, the world is ending. Yeah. In the beginning, you're always going to have those months. When I started out, I was, totally. I, uh, I started in college and right after college, I moved in with my sister in Philly and she was encouraging me, you can do it. We can build a business. And then like, I wasn't making a lot of them. I was making a couple hundred dollars per video. Video work was infrequent at the time. And it, within six months, my loans would kick in, and I was a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. So that and that so that that's just like a forever. It feels like forever. It's like going to be 30, 40 years that 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 loan would run out for. It was about six hundred to seven hundred dollars a month just in student loans. And then on top of that, I had rent. I was like, I can't do this. So I broke the lease and moved home with my parents. Yeah. And I lived with my parents for two years. And I lied to everybody, <laughs> like all my clients. I didn't tell anybody that I was living at home with my parents because that would, just that to me would be like the biggest sign of failure. But it was so important for me to do that because that was my money story. Like I, I, I wouldn't be, I physically, like I literally would not have been able to do it. I would mm-hmm. not have been able to pay rent. But also just that weight, it is like a kind of an emotional weight and a burden on you to have all that money, to have all that responsibility of paying this off while also trying to be creative and you know, start a business, it's, it's just, it's not going to work. So I think you're right on with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much of your flow state comes when your nervous system is regulated. And so when we're obstructing that, that's, you're doing yourself and what you do best in the world, a disservice. Mm-hmm. Are you ready for rapid fire? Oh, fun. Rapid fire. Yeah. Let's <laughs> do like, it. This is the only segment I have on the show, but it's, uh, I it's called rapid fire I gotta come up with a new name but it's uh basically I just have some questions that I ask everybody on the show and it just uh it's really more directed towards people who are just getting started out great um so some of them about you some of them about giving advice to other people so what drives you women's bodies what keeps you creating and and connecting and it, this is not, it's not a, it's not a, I say rapid fire, but it's not like a one sentence answer. Oh, okay. I totally was like, I'm ready. Yeah, Let's yeah. go. Boom, Let's go. Next question. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So, so you can elaborate on it. Sorry. That's my fault. Okay. We asked the question again. Okay. We'll do it again from the top. We can just cut that out now. Um, what drives you? Oh, what drives me is a woman deeply connected to herself and therefore deeply connected to the world around her. What's the best feminine advice you could give to men? Um, get get the app MyFlow. <laughs> get your let your woman get that app, and they send you emails that tell you where she is in her cycle and how you should be approaching sex and talking to her. <laughs> what what is if you could give me the general advice? What's like uh, I guess two or three phases that <laughs> we should be aware of, and how should we be acting? Um, well, definitely when she is in luteal, which is what we like to call the PMS phase, um, you have to be aware that, you know, she's, she's 
a lot more attuned to the things that don't work for her. Mm -hmm. We may see that as, uh, you know, catty or moody, but in fact, it's just that she's like really highly sensitive and attuned and that that's just not a time where you want to try to talk sense to her, you know, come back (laughs) after the bleed. Um, and, um, you know, when she is ovulating, you know, take her out on a date. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Good and in- use protection if you're not ready to have Abs- a kid. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> it's very good advice. Um, so let's say someone is stuck and they're trying to figure out what path to go down in their life. They just don't know which direction to go. What can they do or what should they do today uh, to help them get on the right path? Uh, get into your body. So whatever gives you the most joy, for some people it might be a kickboxing class, someone else it might be a ballet class, someone else it might be Zumba. (laughs) Um, Go get into your body and then come out on the other end, like right after class and check in with yourself. Where do you think you have the biggest room for improvement in your own life or business? So good. Hmm. This is like that, that, uh, classic interview question like what is your biggest weakness <laughs> yeah totally um i would say trust i am not a really i'm not really great with trusting that it all works out i think that i like to control i still it's an ongoing journey of uh, feeling like i need to control hustle create game plans and that there isn't just a natural way in which this will all unfold where you know it works out okay Mm -hmm. yeah totally how do you face doubt i totally check in with my girlfriends and i'm like just tell me nice things about me (laughs) (laughs) yeah you need a little boost every once in a while sisterhood man it's a good self right i have my i have the women who i know who will reflect back to me and they're not going to give me like the bullshit version they're going to give me the like this is truly who i see you as and you're just not seeing that in this moment and so it's a reminder of oh right yeah i totally am that person yeah it's just having the encouragement and support of family or friends and even if it's just one person i remember uh natalie just reminded me about when I was thinking about starting the podcast and kind of going a little bit bigger with this. Uh, I was just like, had so much doubt and I was just, but I just needed her to reassure me that I was doing the right thing and that it was worth it to put this stuff out there. And just that little bump, she's like, do it. Like, what are you waiting for? And I was like, you're right. I totally need to do this. But it's like, sometimes you know the answer, but you just need somebody else who knows you that, that you trust to be able to kind of push you in the right direction. Yeah. What one tool or skill have you utilized that you think you have have leveraged in a way that others haven't? Hmm. So for me, it would be moving meditation, which is, you know, it could be a one minute practice, a 10 minute practice, however long you go for two hours. Um, but where you essentially, you know, put on a fun song and it could be rock set. It could be anything (laughs) that, that makes you feel good. Um, and you know, men can totally do this too, but that's a huge challenge. Like that's like, you gotta be like super in your mastery there. Yeah. Um, but I think it's primarily more focused for women where, you know, we slow down and we do very simple movements that aren't complicated at all, that aren't like a workout or fitness oriented movement, but just slow enough that we're, we're still moving, but we can find stillness in the motion. Mm-hmm. And, um, for me, that always brings me back to my truth, which is that I'm in this body and this, these are the feelings I can sense and just t- it removes all the like chitter chatter stuff happening in my head, all the monkey mind business. Is that yeah. your main meditative practice or do you also do uh, still meditation? I do both. I have to say I've been pretty bad recently about yeah, still. Talk about still. guilt. <laughs> I, <feel good. laughs> right. I, I have that a lot where I know that when I'm meditating and if I'm like having some kind of mindfulness practice of drinking tea before bed, I'm happier and more fulfilled, but it is it is difficult to, to keep a practice like that going. And I do. I'm a believer in, you know, and I totally didn't embody this right now, but I'm a believer in like you, you take on something, you adopt something for a while because it's what you need the most right now. And that might not be the case in a year or two. So when I first started meditating, I did it every single day for quite a few years. Like I was very gung ho about it. 
And then at some point I just realized I, um, I got this, like it's still incredibly beneficial, but for me, what I need right now is more moving meditation, more dance breaks, more other, other ways to get into my body, Mm -hmm. um, that serve me better in terms of what I want, which is clear mind and connection to self. Right. All right. So one more question. Name one thing that people need to watch, listen to, or read before they go to bed tonight. And you can do all three if you want, or if there's just tonight. one Tonight? Yeah, tonight. And uh, it could be just gets getting started. So if it's a long book, if they read the first paragraph, first chapter. Uh, the Body Keeps Score is what I'm on, I'm doing right now. And it's uh, an amazing book about how the body keeps score. <laughs> and so it's all about, um, you know, how our nervous system wires like trauma and how a mm-hmm. lot of the things that pop up in our adult life is really things that are trying to be um, cleared and solved from that, you know, happened when we were much younger. And uh, I find that this is an area that's not spoken about enough in coaching, in wellness, because, uh, well, I don't know why it's not spoken enough of, but it, it's the second I got into all of the, you know, trauma resolution and neuroscience piece of all of this, I'm like, huh, this answers everything oh, really? <laughs> for me at least. So this yeah. is for men and women. Uh, totally. Yeah. 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 This is nothing to do with, sp- yeah, it's not just a woman thing. All right, cool. That's great. Uh, anything to, cause I know you're, you're big into uh, this kind of stuff. So anything to listen to or watch? My God, I feel like I'm going to walk away from here and be like, Oh man, there's so many things. Well, I'm a big fan of Ted talks in general. I think a lot of people are, and I would highly recommend watching, uh, Sheila Kelly and her talk is called let's get naked. Hmm. I would say this one is geared towards the women, um, but I think it's beautiful for men to watch as well because it's really important for them to understand what's going on in the collective psyche of women. Very important. <laughs> and uh, what they're calling, I guess, fourth wave feminism. So. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for coming up to the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in to The Ground Up Show. I'm giving away access to two hours worth of extended interviews to anyone who reviews The Ground Up Show on iTunes. These interviews with the producers of Minimalism give a never-before-seen look at how he created the film from nothing. Simply send a screenshot of your review to hello at mattdiavella.com, and I'll send you the private links to watch the interviews. This episode was produced by Conrad Golovac and myself. Thanks for watching.